Good morning. Certainly is good to see each of you here this morning. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be able to worship God with you all this morning. So thankful for the opportunity to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, this morning. Before we begin, I would like to publicly thank uh, the congregation that meets here at East Hill uh, for their love and their care and their hospitality that has been shown to me and to my wife. We are just thrilled uh, beyond measure to be here and to be able to be, to be able to work with this congregation here. So thankful uh, for you all and your example to us. We, uh, we moved in just a week ago this past Thursday, um, and we were exhausted when we rolled in, and we walked into the house, and there were uh, bins and baskets full of food and supplies that we needed, and we were just so grateful to see that, and it just, it's a testament of your love and your care for the, for the individuals who uh, belong to this congregation. I'm so thankful for everyone here. I'm grateful for the elders, uh, for Joe and for Joe and for Johnny and for their uh, leadership of this congregation. Um, and I pray God's uh, richest blessings upon them. I'm also thankful for Brother Jonathan and for his willingness to boldly proclaim the Word of God. And I'm grateful uh, for the opportunity to work alongside him and to be able to learn from him. And I'm just grateful uh, for you all and for the opportunity uh, to worship God this morning. You know, it's little things like this, like being able to gather together and worship God, that I think we oftentimes take for granted until it's taken away from us, isn't it? Because so often uh, with, with the quarantine and the pandemic that has happened, that's been taken away from us. Um, and the ability to gather in person to worship God is something we should always be thankful for and how thankful we ought to be for this opportunity this morning uh, to worship God. Suppose I were to ask you a question this morning, who are you? What would you say? If you were to ask, if, I were, if you were to supposed to define yourself to someone who knew nothing about you, what would you say? Or maybe your answer would have something to do with your job. Maybe your answer would have something to do about your family or your name. Perhaps your answer would have something to do about your interests or your hobbies. However, I hope that of everyone here this morning, that if we were asked to define who we are to someone who knew nothing about us, that our answer would have everything to do with our faith in God, with our love for His Word and how our lives are centered around Jesus Christ. You see, the Apostle Paul speaks some very famous words, some words that we all know very well in Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 17. Now, suppose for a moment we were to go to the Gospel of John, and we're not going to do that because our focus is in Romans chapter 1. But suppose for a moment we were to go to the Gospel of John, what would we find? Well, we would find that Jesus, all throughout this, this book of John, asserts what we know and what we call as the I am statements. And there are seven of these statements throughout the Gospel of John. And these I am statements that Jesus makes are very, very important for us to know because they prove a lot of different things. But number one, they prove that Jesus not only existed, but that number two, he is who he claimed to be. You see, they prove of his deity, not only stating that he was or that he will be, but that Jesus Christ simply is. Well, if we go back to the first chapter of Romans, we find Paul using some of the exact same language that Jesus used. Now, he obviously wasn't making the same claims as our Lord was because Jesus Christ was deity. Paul is not, and Paul knew that. However, these statements are very important for us to know and to keep in mind because within all three of these statements, the Apostle Paul is stating something about his identity. He is defining who he is to the ones to whom he is writing, and I think that we could even go beyond that. And we could say that the things that the Apostle Paul says about himself in Romans chapter 1 are things that we too ought to be able to say about ourselves as well. Paul makes three I am statements, and I want to look at those this morning, and then the lesson will be yours. The first statement is this. He says, I am, in verse 14, I am a debtor. Look at verse 14. Let's read this again. Paul says, I am a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Have you ever been in debt before? Have you ever owed a large summation of money before to perhaps a person or maybe to a company or perhaps to a bank? You know, I think when we look at our world's uh, culture and our society today, it's not really uncommon, is it, to know someone or perhaps to even be someone who is in debt over something like a mortgage or maybe a car payment or, or student loans. And I'm sure that there is that great relief whenever that burden of that debt is lifted off after that debt is finally paid off. You see, the Apostle Paul is talking about this idea of a debt. However, it's a debt that no matter how long he lived, no matter what he did in this life, he would never be able to pay it off. 
There was not enough money in this world. There were not enough resources for the Apostle Paul to be able to pay off this debt. And so Paul is speaking from this frame of mind. He's saying that he owes this insurmountable debt. Now, I'm sure many questions could come to mind, but one of the questions that we could ask is, well, Paul, to whom did you owe this debt? Who were you owing this debt to? And if we're not looking at our text of Romans 1, we might think of several names and individuals that come to mind. But Paul lays it out for us here, doesn't he? And he makes this contrast between these groups of people. And he talks first here about the Greeks and the barbarians. And I want to look at this contrast here for just a moment this morning. This word barbarian, it comes from a word that means to stutter or to stammer. And perhaps Paul here is showing some sort of cultural contrast because back in the Roman times, there were really only two groups of people. The groups of of the Greeks who spoke that language, and then there was everyone else. And so Greek writers would oftentimes write about those who didn't speak the Greek language. And they would write about those who spoke in that foreign tongue and how whenever they spoke, it sounded like they were literally saying bar, bar, bar to them. Hence the word barbarians. And then, of course, we know that that word would evolve over time and it would come to mean this word barbarian, which means wild and and crude and uncivilized. And so what's Paul saying? Well, Paul is saying here, he says, I'm obligated both to the civilized, the Greeks, and to the uncivilized, both to the cultured and to the uncultured. But then he makes another contrast here in verse 14 at the end of the verse. Who does he talk about here? He says, the wise and also the unwise. This word wise, referring to those who, those who are above average, those who are high in intelligence, those who are high in knowledge. But then he also says, he talks about those who are the unwise, the foolish. If we think about this word foolish, it shows up time and time again, passage after passage in Scripture, but it always has bad associations with it. Jesus Christ spoke of the foolish, and he described them to be those who were slow of heart to believe the truth, Luke chapter 24 and verse 35. It describes those who are mesmerized by the materialistic nature of this world, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. It's used to talk about those who are led away by the various lusts and desires that this world has to offer, Titus chapter 3 and verse 3. Not really a group of people that we would want to be associated with, is it? In fact, the Apostle Paul shows us this, but he also recognized that there were those with whom he came in contact who also fell into this category. And so here we have Paul making this contrast between the elite, the higher up, the the Greeks. But then he also talks about the lesser of the two, the uncivilized, the, uh, the foolish, the barbarians. And so essentially Paul is saying, I am indebted to who? To everyone. And we're going to see what it is that he owes them in just a few moments. But another question we could ask is, well, why? Paul, why do you owe this debt to all of these individuals? And to answer that question, we're going to have to go elsewhere from the book of Romans. We're not going to find the answer here. You know, if we look at the Apostle Paul just a few years before this moment in time, he was in a completely different place, wasn't he? He was a killer of Christians, wasn't he? He was a persecutor of Christians. The Apostle Paul at the time known as Saul was known for dragging Christians out of their home, for killing them, for stoning them, for doing all sorts of terrible things to them. Saul was a terror to the Lord's church. And so maybe we think that the Apostle Paul owes such a great debt because of his woefully sinful past. Because you see, passage after passage after passage in Scripture, it shows us that Paul still seemed to be struggling and coming to grips with the things that he had done to those who were part of the kingdom of God. And so maybe the Apostle Paul felt that the debt that he owed so strongly was because of some of the things that he had done in his past. I realize that we all come from different places. I know that we all have different backgrounds and there are things that have happened in our lives that have helped shape us to be who we are today. I'm sure that there are a number of us here this morning who grew up within the Lord's church. There are a number of us who grew up within perhaps these walls here or maybe the walls of another church building, but you grew up within the church of Christ. And you remember going to Bible class and going to to Sunday school and Wednesday uh, Bible class week in and week out, and you remember learning about the story of Jesus and his love for this world. You remember about singing the songs about creation and learning the books of the Bible and singing the songs about the judges and all kinds of things like that. But then I'm also sure that there are some here this morning who did not grow up in the Lord's church. You used to be in the world, but now you're a part of the church of Christ. You used to live a life that was not according to the Scriptures. You used to live a life that was not lived in humble submission to God and His Word, but now you're a part of the Lord's church. You're a part of the family of God. 
Ask yourself this question. Who owes the greater debt? Is it the one with the woefully sinful past or is it the one who grew up and was a part of the Lord's church from the time they were born? Brothers and sisters, let me be the first to tell you this morning that we all owe the exact same debt. Because you see, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your name is. It doesn't matter what job you have, how much money you make, the color of your skin. Because the first time that any of us ever transgressed the law of God, the first time that any of us ever sinned against our Creator, we were and are described the way Paul describes all men in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, and that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And while we're at it, let me ask you another question. When we look at this book of Romans here, who does Paul speak more harshly to? Is it to, is it to the Gentiles in chapter 1, or is it to the Jews in chapter 2? Well, the answer is equally to both in chapter 3 and verse 10, where he says, there is none righteous, no, not one. You see, we all owe this debt to everyone because we all have a sinful past. We all are and have been in need of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so if we go back and examine the question we asked a moment ago, to whom does Paul owe this great debt? We know that he owes it to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and to the unwise. And so essentially he's saying he owes it to everyone. But when we look at it with the big picture in mind, Paul says ultimately he owes this debt to God. You know, I think about the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 22. Whenever he was recalling the account of his conversion, whenever he was on that road to Damascus and the Lord shined down on him in that great light and he blinded him from his eyesight. And you remember that he was told to go into Damascus and when he got there, there he will be told what he must do. And you remember that God then told Ananias to go and preach to him. And Ananias went and preached to Paul. And at the end of that sermon in Acts 22 and verse 16, you remember Ananias said, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. But you see, before Ananias ever went to go and preach to Paul, God prompted him to go by saying in Acts chapter 9 and verse 15, go. Well, Ananias is probably thinking, well, why? God, why do you want me to go and preach to a killer of Christians? God says, well, because he's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, before kings, before the children of Israel. Verse 16, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Maybe that's why the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. You see, brothers and sisters, we all owe a debt, don't we? Just like the Apostle Paul, we owe a debt. We owe a debt to our family. We owe a debt to our friends. We owe a debt to those we like. We owe a debt to maybe those we don't like too. You see, we owe a debt, and, I, and that debt is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're going to get into that in just a few moments. But number one, the Apostle Paul says, I am a debtor. This second I am statement is found in verse 15 where he says, I am ready. Some versions might say, I am eager. Look at verse 15. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Do you remember who the Minutemen were in our country's history? You remember that they were these so-called uh, militia members, those non-professional soldiers who had to be ready within a literal minute's notice to drop whatever it was that they were doing to go and defend their people from the British. And you might remember that their calling involved more than just holding rifles and going to fight, but rather that they were tasked with the, with the, uh, uh, with the opportunity to go out and to try and find out as much information as they could to go and spread it to the other colonies. And because of this, they had to be fit individuals. They had to be healthy individuals. They had to be individuals who were under the age of 30. They had to be in great shape so that they could take that information and spread it as quickly as possible. I think we could all say that probably the most famous Minutemen of all was Mr. Paul Revere. And you remember he's famous for rushing across the countryside saying, the British are coming, the British are coming. I think we might be able to say that God's greatest Minutemen was the Apostle Paul. Because you see, Paul was ever ready, wasn't he? Paul was always ready. Paul was always eager. And the Bible portrays for us a man who not only recognized the debt that he owed, but who is now ready and eager to try and fulfill that debt. You know, when we think about the Apostle Paul specifically, he was saying that he was ready to preach, to the, gospel, preach the gospel to those who were in Rome, 
to those who were Christians. Paul's saying, I don't just owe a debt to those who are lost. I owe a debt to those who are Christians. I owe a debt to every single person to teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, there are so many things within the Word of God, actually everything within the Word of God, that He would have us to share with one another so that we can challenge one another, so that we can grow in our faith and our knowledge of His Word, and that's exactly what the Apostle Paul wanted. If you go back a couple of verses in our text here of Romans chapter 1, and you go back to verses 8 through 10, the Apostle Paul is letting the brethren there know that he had been praying for them. He had been praying about them. He had been praying concerning them. But what's interesting is, is that he didn't even know who these brethren were. He had never met them before. He had he had been trying to get to them. He had been longing to get to them. He had been trying to spend time with them, but he couldn't. And so he says in verses 13 through 15, he says, I'll pray for you so that you can grow in your faith. And I think that we can say that this was not just some checkbox for the Apostle Paul to mark off whenever he got home at the end of the day. This was not just some random debt or some obligation that he felt like, yeah, I guess I'll fulfill if I have time. This was something that the Apostle Paul was ready and eager to fulfill. I'm reminded of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah, really the Old Testament version of the Apostle Paul. You see, Jeremiah was a faithful prophet to God, and God had tasked him uh, to go out and to teach and preach to the people, and he was rejected because of it. He suffered because of it. And in Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9, he said, I will not make mention of him, nor will I speak any more in his name. But then he said, but his word was in my heart, like a fire shut up in my bones, and I could not hold back. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Sounds like the Apostle Paul, doesn't it? Someone who was ready and someone who was eager to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I guess the question that remains then is, well, what was he so ready and eager to share? What was this that Paul was so willing to spread to others? Well, you and I know that it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the good news that we have today that we must share with others. He was ready to share that our Father in heaven has provided us with an opportunity to have life eternal, to not be in eternal pain and sorrow and suffering, to live in a mansion with our Creator one day. Interestingly enough, there were those in the first century who needed to hear this as well. Think about the church at Ephesus. I think about the church at Ephesus. They were a great congregation, weren't they? They were a congregation that was full of great and godly people. They were individuals uh, who knew the Word of God. And we can see throughout Scripture how they were established in the book of Acts. We can see how they were growing in the book of Ephesians. We can even go to the book of 1 Timothy and see how they were being admonished there. But then we get to the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible. And Jesus is speaking to them, and He says some good things about them, but He also has some things against them. And in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, our Lord tells them that they needed to be zealous. They had, lost their, they had left their first love. And he said, return to being zealous and repent of your sins. You know, that can happen to us today as well, can't it? That in even doing great things in the kingdom, that in even working for the Lord, sometimes our hearts can detach and sometimes we can just be going through the motions. But you see, we need to be ready to say, just like the Apostle Paul, that we're ready, that we're eager to fulfill all that God would have us to do. You know, there is no greater disease or sickness than that of sin. But the good news is that that we have found the remedy, haven't we? That remedy being the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so if we have the remedy to completely blot out the greatest sickness that this world has ever known, then why would we not want to share that with others? The third and final I am statement that Paul makes in this passage is in verse 16. The Apostle Paul says, I am not ashamed. Look at this. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Go ahead and turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 9, and I want to spend the last couple of minutes there this morning with you to make a point as we close out this morning. Luke chapter 9. Would it not be amazing to be able to get inside of the head of the Apostle Paul? And to see just how it was that he dealt with certain situations in life. Because you see, he was human just like you and me. How was he able to get outside of his comfort zone and to grow so bold in teaching others about Jesus Christ? I think about what, second, what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. When he said, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? Of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Now, I am no Greek scholar by any means, but I can look up some words just as well as you can. 
If you go back to the original Greek language in which 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 was written, you'll find that that word fear does not reference the phobia kind of fear. That's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about the, the being timid or the being scared or the, the Halloween scary type of fear. That's not what it's talking about. But rather it's this word delia. And this word delia references someone who lacks courage, someone who is a coward, someone who is frightened about their faith. So what is Paul telling Timothy here in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7? He's telling Timothy, he says, don't have a mind, don't have an attitude that lacks courage. You see, God has not given you, Timothy, a mind or an attitude in which you can be a coward about your faith in God. And in fact, if you go three chapters later into 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, what's the charge that Paul lays out for Timothy? He says, preach the word and then to do it when? Whenever he felt like it, whenever it was convenient, whenever there was an opportunity to do it and no one was going to hurt you. He said, in season and out of season, all the time. Timothy, don't be scared. Don't be a coward about going about and doing what it is that God would have you to do. Essentially, Paul tells Timothy, don't be ashamed. Let me show you how important this is. In Revelation chapter 21, we'll get to Luke chapter 9 in just a minute. In Revelation chapter 21, John is, you know, John is receiving all of these signs. He's receiving all of these visions from God. And in verse 4, he begins to talk about heaven. And he gives us this beautiful description of what heaven is going to be like. But then you jump down to verse 8, and we hit a very stark contrast. Because he begins to talk about hell, that, that place of the second death. And in the King James Version, the first three words of verse 8 say, But the fearful. And then if you read in the New King James Version and you look at verse 8, you see the first three words are, but the cowardly. Does anyone want to guess what that Greek word is there? It's that word delia. The same word that Paul told Timothy not to have, to not have a spirit or a mind of fear. That's how important this is, that if we're cowards about our faith and our Christianity, if we have minds and attitudes uh, that are being fearful of being Christians, then look at what God says we're deserving of at the end of verse 8. He says, They shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? We must be just like the Apostle Paul in that we are unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes I think on some level, though, that we are ashamed of the gospel because it's God's good news and not our own good news. In Luke chapter 9, I told you we're going to get there in just a moment. Luke chapter 9, if you pick up in verse 23, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and look at what he says here. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. You see, Jesus is showing us that it is imperative that we overcome our shame. Brothers and sisters, we ought to want to be bold, just like the Apostle Paul. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote these words, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power. It is not a power. It's not another power. It is the only power. It is the only power. It's the power of God unto salvation. That which saves us from our sins and allows us an opportunity to spend our eternity in in heaven with God. It's the power of God unto salvation for everyone. You see, that includes you and me today, doesn't it? That includes everyone within these walls, but that also includes everyone outside of these walls as well. There was a man who once made the comparison, and he said, people are not lost because they have not heard the good news, but rather they are lost because they have not done anything about it. He would go on to say that we die because of disease, not because there is a lack of a proper cure. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you spiritually sick this morning? 
Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian. I know that you can change that this morning. You can come down this aisle. We can take your confession. We can baptize you into water for the remission of your sins. The blood of Jesus Christ washing your sins clean. And you can start brand new. And you can walk out these doors rejoicing just as the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8. But maybe you're here this morning and you are a Christian, but perhaps your priorities aren't in the right place. Maybe you're not faithfully living to God. Perhaps you're someone like we talked about this morning who is ashamed of Jesus Christ and what He's done for us, know that you can change that as well. You can come forward and you can repent of those things. We can pray for you and you too can have your slate wiped clean as well. Or maybe you're here and you just need the prayers and the encouragement of the church. Know that we would be happy to pray for you. Whatever your need, let us know as together we stand and as we sing the invitation song.